ChatGPT blew my mind today. And I've been using it as a coding assistant for many months now, so I was already well aware of how useful it can be when both reviewing your own handcrafted code and having it generate new code for you. But today, it took it to another level. Not only was I able to get it to take my code and debug it, I was then able to provide a digital screenshot of the output for the malfunctioning drawing code, feed that back into ChatGPT, and it was able to diagnose problems by looking at the screen. And today, I'll take you through how I did it. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. First, let me set the stage as to why I'm writing graphics routines on a 6502 in the first place. Now, I've been programming in 6502 assembly for 40 years now with various breaks interspersed. But it's what I started my coding career with and thanks in no small part to the fact that the hardware that I learned on back in the day is retro and cool now, I'm right back at it. I've been restoring a pair of Super Pets as well as multiple examples of Kim 1 single board computers and they're all 6502 powered. One of those Kim 1s came from an old school 1970s hobbyist who was clearly some kind of mad scientist super genius. I say that because this Kim 1 was accompanied not only by a backplane that gave it an extensible system bus, but that bus was then fully populated with extension cards like RAM expansions, EEPROM burners, ROM cards, even a disc controller and then a video graphics board. In fact, this bus was so full that this guy, whose name is Michael, wired two backplanes together by hand, soldering jumper wires for every single trace on both the application and the extension buses. Imagine if your motherboard didn't have enough PCI slots, so you added four more and hand wired them in. Because that's precisely what Michael did. He also appears to have hand-built all the boards himself, but they were designed and produced by a company called MTU. I imagine he got the PCBs and went from there, or perhaps it was a kit with components. Either way, what makes it all the more impressive is that Michael must have been a very early adopter of the MTU hardware, as there were a lot of design errata and a lot of correspondence back and forth with MTU engineer Hal Chamberlain, who designed the boards. So not only was Michael starting with a kit, but that kit required more than just assembly skills, as evidenced by the highly annotated schematics and notes that he probably made while troubleshooting a seemingly endless string of birthing problems. Long story short, though, it all ultimately worked perfectly. It was an incredibly capable system for its day, comparable to the later Pets and Apples, but constructed from a single board computer. Some 40 years or so later, he sold it on eBay, which is where I found it. It came with a ton of documentation as well, but it wasn't running as is. And that meant I had a choice. Either try to recreate and repair whatever changes and upgrades Michael had made over the years, or return it to a entirely original, which I knew would work. I opted for the latter path, something made easier by the fact that I now had a serial I.O. board from Corsham that would give me a terminal connection on an unmodified Kim 1. I've been tinkering with the Kim 1 stack for a year or two now, and I've made a couple of episodes that you can check out for more details on the system. But the highlight of it is the graphics display, a 320 by 200 memory mapped bitmap display. The first thing I did was to port a C compiler known as CC65 over to the Kim 1 platform so that I could write in C. Because even though I'm pretty proficient in 6502 assembly, some days it's just not a lot of fun. There's one 8-bit accumulator called A and two 8-bit index registers named X and Y and that's about it. You can add and subtract and branch, but there's no multiply or divide, and any numbers larger than 255, such as an X coordinate, need to be stored as adjacent pairs in the first page of memory. It's so limited that it's often a puzzle that requires significant thought as to how you're going to solve it in 6502. I just wanted to draw lines and circles and text on my Kim 1, and so I figured that C would be a lot faster. And even factoring in time to port the compiler, I think it proved to be true. Pretty soon I had lines drawing more A patterns and concentric circles as well as text scrolling and cursor management. But somehow it all felt a bit like cheating because back in the day it would have been done in assembly language. The code generated by CC65 is kind of interesting. It's like if your dog plays the piano, you don't really complain about how well he does it, it's more that he does it at all. And it's a bit like that, because generating create machine code from C in a 6502 environment is no mean feat. Now, CC65 does an admirable job, but it's not going to often beat hand-coded assembly. My C version was nothing if not brief and efficient, so I figured ChatGPT might be able to make quick work of a translation to 6502. 
Now, ChatGPT isn't usually able to generate running 6502 right out of the box, but sometimes just seeing how it structures its approach is handy, if nothing else. So I gave it my C code and I asked for a 6502 version. And like a genie who gives you what you asked for instead of what you really wanted, it gave me some code that might have worked for all I know, but I could see right away that it wasn't practical. It was doing a step-by-step -step multiplication for every pixel, which would be painfully slow. It wasn't my first rodeo, so it was time to just write it from scratch and do it right. Something that made my life a lot easier was the Kim One simulator written by a fellow named Hans. I'll put a link in the video description in case you want to play with it. My own interest in the Kim One was rekindled when a guy named Eduardo reached out to get some details on my graphics board, and he's since constructed a full working replica. Along the way, they rescued much of the documentation and sample code that would prove to be essential. In the MTU documentation, I found a nice and brief bit of code to calculate the address and memory of a pixel given the X and Y coordinates, and it didn't use multiplication or looping. It wasn't perhaps as efficient as the table lookup approach that I had been planning, but it was elegant enough that I went with it. Next, though, I needed a circle implementation. I already had a nice and fast one in the C++ version, a dandy implementation of the midpoint circle algorithm. You might remember from high school that a circle is defined as all the points that are an equal distance from some midpoint. If you try to draw a circle via the conventional approach, you need to call sine and cosine once per pixel, and there are three problems with that. For one, it's slow, and for two, it requires floating point, which is both slow and complicated, and three, it requires the trig functions. But there's a way to do it that fixes all of that. It was pioneered by Jack Brazenham of line drawing fame back at IBM in 1962. The midpoint circle algorithm is a clever and efficient way to draw circles on a raster display without using any trigonometric functions. It takes advantage of the circle symmetry and the properties of integer arithmetic. Let's break down the core ideas first. Now the first is symmetry. A circle is symmetric about its center, so if you figure out the points in say one-eighth of the circle, you can reflect those points to generate an entire circle. Specifically, if you find the points in the 45 degree segment from the x-axis to the line where y equals x, you can easily generate all the other points. The other big idea is the midpoint decision. The algorithm decides which pixel is closer to the true circle between two candidates, the one directly to the right and one up and to the right, in other words, diagonally upwards. The algorithm uses a decision parameter to make this decision. If error, in my code, is below zero, then the next point is directly to the right. If it's zero or above, the next point is diagonally upwards. Now the genius behind this algorithm is that it only uses integer addition and subtraction at each step. The value of error is essentially a way to keep track of the vertical distance between the true circle and the midpoint of the two candidate pixels. Based on this distance, all the algorithm is doing is deciding which pixel is closer to the real circle, and the rest just takes care of itself. Of course, it only works for the bottom right segment of the circle, but since the circle is symmetrical as I noted, we can draw all eight segments using the offsets from the one that we do calculate. I went ahead and wrote my best first shot at it in assembly, and it didn't crash or hang, but it didn't draw circles either. At first, it drew a dotted line on a slight angle. It was rather curious. Next, I did what I usually do, at least if I can't debug it live. I read through the code again and fix anything I could find and repeat until I can't find anything else that's wrong. Then when I've run out of ideas, I pasted that code into ChatGPT. It had a few educated guesses, but there was no smoking gun in the code. And that's when I had an epiphany. You can now upload images to ChatGPT and it will use them as additional context in your discussion. I could see on the screen what it was drawing and I thought perhaps ChatGPT is smart enough that if it can see it too, it can use that as information and context to assist in debugging. And so I took a screenshot and uploaded it and then asked it for insights. When I did so, given both the code and the output, it said the following. Given the output, I see several lines of pixels that don't form a full circle. The dots are symmetrical about the X and Y axes, suggesting that the set pixel calls in the circle drawing algorithm are correct, but the logic governing the loop and the air checking for the circle drawing function isn't working as expected. Although it wasn't very specific, I made some tweaks based on its feedback, and that led to an image that looked like it was straight out of the 1980s vector arcade game Star Wars. Pretty impressive in some ways, but still nothing like circles. So I uploaded the new image back up to ChatGPT along with the updated code to see what it would have to say. Primarily, it was concerned with how I was handling the sign bit on a temporary value and it didn't like the way I was doing a comparison. So I updated those two to be more to its liking and then repeated the process. 
I won't delve too far into the minutiae of debugging this assembly language, particularly on the 6502, where any one instruction is usually just a small part of a much larger operation that you have to deduce from context. Eventually, we got it to the point where it was drawing squares instead of circles, which was actually a lot closer to working, even if it doesn't sound like it. I simplified things by drawing just one segment of the circle, which came out as a flat line. And that meant that the midpoint algorithm was never stepping up and to the right which allowed me to focus on that test and find the actual bug. So at the end of the day, it still took me as a human to fix the actual bug, but ChatGPT was an amazing tool and companion along the way. Now think about what's actually happening here. The AI is writing code, or I'm writing code, and then I'm taking that code and running and capturing the output and feeding it back into the AI so that it can see what the code is producing. It then operates in a feedback loop with me as the human tester in the middle but there's no real need for me to be in the loop, technically. In theory, if you could run ChatGPT closed loop, it could iterate on its own solutions. This is a rare case where an AI can fine tune its own work by chasing a reward function after the fact. It can write code, test that code automatically, and then revise until the desired output was achieved, all while you enjoy a latte. Imagine that ChatGPT had a Kim1 simulator built in and could not only check its output immediately, but also single step and debug the machine state as needed. We're not there yet, but we're close. And when we get there, the applications will of course be for a lot more than writing code for a Kim 1. Because it's far more expressive, ChatGPT does even better with higher level languages like Python. Better yet, it now supports an extension that features a Python interpreter built in that lets it evaluate both your code and its own. If you're interested in seeing how that works, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel. That serves two functions. First, if you turn on all notifications for your subscription, it ensures you won't miss future episodes. And second, I gauge interest in a topic in no small part by the number of new subscribers. So it lets me know that you want more of a topic. If you know, love, live with, or work with someone who's on the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon using the link in the video description. It's everything I know now about autism and Asperger's that I wish I'd known way back then. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.